Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. No pressure, Brian. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com. If you're an entrepreneur running a six, seven, or eight-figure business and want to grow and want to be around other top performers, this is for you. It's a group of top entrepreneurs that come together to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Rise25 is run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran, former White House writer under Bill Clinton, Silicon Valley attorney and entrepreneur. Check out Rise25.com. It's application only. Brian, today we have Brian Goulet. He's co-founder of the Goulet Pen Company with his wife, Rachel. They run an online retail store focusing on fountain pens, ink, paper, and other tools for the writing enthusiast. They've grown it from a mom-and-pop startup from their dining room table to a multi-million dollar operation with over 40 team members and a 12,000 square foot office space warehouse. Brian, thanks for joining me. Absolutely, Jeremy. It's a thrill to be here. Thank you so much. You know, I have a lot of questions about your journey. It's really, like you said before we, we started hitting record, is a, a winding road. But I have to ask about the signature Goulet packing method. Yes. Talk about um, that. <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, we're kind of known for the way that we pack things, you know, especially being in e-commerce. We don't have a brick and mortar storefront. So one of the first interactions, physical interactions that our customers have with us yeah. is opening up that package, right? And uh, we Do you have one handy of, by chance? I don't have oh, one. Oh, okay. I okay. didn't grab it ahead of time, no. But uh, there's, there's videos and stuff out there of people that are unboxing yeah. our stuff. And you can see it's lots of bubble wrap, lots of stretch wrap, which is in our signature Goulet Blue color. Um, but uh, we try to make it a part of the experience, especially because the products that we sell are uh, quite fragile. You know, you're talking about glass bottles of ink that if they break, they'll spill over Forget and ruin everything. <laughs> <laughs> Notebooks and things that can easily be bent or damaged and, you know, expensive pens. So we try to put a lot of care into the way we pack our stuff. So did that come just because it's fragile or did it come from the customer service or both? What what started that? It was really kind of both. Um, you know, you mentioned we started out in our dining room. Literally, my wife and I, we had really not a lot of experience. I had worked a lot of like warehouse jobs and stuff when I was younger. So I had some, you know, tactile experience packing things and making boxes and stuff. Um, but literally we would finish up dinner, clear off the dinner table, and then we would pull out the bubble wrap and, you know, start wrapping up stuff in the very earliest days of our business. Um, but as we grew, you know, stuff would get damaged in shipping. And to us, that just felt like that was our responsibility. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like that the customer can't do anything about that. We need to do everything we can to make sure it gets there safely to them. So part of it was like a, an element of personal responsibility. And then it kind of quickly evolved after a few months into, you know what, this is an opportunity to really make this a great part of the experience. And then, you know, by, you know, making it a great experience, somebody getting the package, then uh, that is just a positive interaction you know, that's a kind of a continued part of that, uh, that great experience they've had up to that point. Yeah. So Brian, since we don't have one to unbox, tell, <laughs> what does that look like? Someone opens it. What is part of that, that experience? Yeah, so for us, we found, you know, we have we have about 3,700 different products on our store. And, you know, you're talking about bottles of ink and pens and stuff that are in kind of like box shapes. And they're all relatively small. So we have kind of a challenge when packing our stuff. It's a little bit like playing Tetris. You know, somebody might order 20 different products that are all relatively low price that are in one package. And we have to try to pack it as efficiently as possible to keep the cost of the shipping down and also as safely as possible so that everything arrives in good condition. So it's kind of this art form of packing it uh, the way that we do. And so we kind of arrange everything so that it's in kind of like a solid brick. And then we take the stretch wrap and we get it so that it's kind of one solid unit. And uh, through our experience over the years, we've learned that when there's certain types of ink and stuff like that, that we have some bottles have a little bit more of a tendency to break than others. So we will always wrap those individually. That way, if it does break, it doesn't get all over everything. Yeah. What's it's been the biggest recently. packing mishap? That you've seen the biggest mishap one yeah. time we had to ship 
it was probably a hundred bottles of ink to Taiwan and a couple of the bottles broke in that shipment and it ruined about 80% of the shipment in wow. terms of like ruining the labels and all that kind of stuff. That was kind of a special circumstance because typically we don't sell in that quantity because right. really most of our customers are just individual enthusiasts that are into it. Um, but that was just, you know, it's one of those rare things we kind of made an exception and then as luck would have it, like, look what happened. a lot of it no got more exceptions. <laughs> Yeah, and we're like, you know what? Darn it. <laughs> this is why we don't do this kind of stuff. So, Who is the ideal customer? Who's, who's buying? You know, it's interesting because obviously, you know, being the size that we are, we're trying to look and understand those exact kind of questions more. Um, but, you know, we don't have the resources to have a lot of big data type stuff. So um, really to just kind of summarize it, it's just yeah. people like you and me. It's individuals who have an interest in fountain pens, are kind of curious about them, start searching online. Pretty much if you're interested in fountain pens at this point, we've been doing it almost seven years now, right. you're going to find us. You're going to see YouTube videos, you're going to see our blog and our website, yeah. and we have a lot of educational material right. to get people yeah. into fountain pens who've never used them before. So yeah. it's really no government contracts, no businesses or corporate contracts or anything like that. Not a huge gift crowd. Probably most of the people buying gifts are buying it for themselves. Uh, it's really just individual enthusiasts who yeah. love Found yeah. To say, Brian, a lot of you uh, content is an understatement. Um, if anyone's checked out, I encourage people to go on YouTube and you have 46,000 YouTube followers for yeah. your channel. And you're yeah. producing, I don't even know how you produce this much content, maybe four or five videos per week. Um, and I'm going to talk about YouTube um, later. But um, I have to ask about, tell me about the event you went to, Dave Ramsey, Gary V, Seth Godin. Yeah. What happened? So that was a one-time event that they put on almost two years ago at this point. Uh, it was called Business Gets Personal. Yeah. It was hosted up in New York City. And uh, for me, it was an iconic event because the three of them usually don't do that much stuff together. They are all big names in their own right. And for whatever reason, they decided it was Dave Ramsey that was putting on the event and Seth and Gary kind of latched on because they're both in New York. So um, they decided to do this one day event. And I heard about this and I was like, well, OK, I got to do this because all three of them have written books that have greatly impacted me in the way I run my business. You know, Dave Ramsey with Entree Leadership. Um, and then, of course, Financial Peace, too, is a big one. And then Gary Vaynerchuk, his book Crush It is the reason I do videos now. But all of his books have been phenomenal. Um, Seth Godin's written a ton of good ones, but especially his book The Dip and Tribes. Those have really, um, you know, had a good impact on me as well. So to have all three of them there, it was kind of like a bucket list type of thing for me to just like, I want to meet these guys in person, shake their hand and just thank them right. for writing their book because it really changed my life. Yeah. And uh, as it would have it, as luck would have it, they had this thing called the hot seat where they were going to take two businesses out of the 700 or whatever that were going to be there. Right. And they were going to put them up on stage for a 15 minute grill session, session basically to grind into you about your business. And I was like, I don't even know how to get into this thing. But I like had just like strike of like an epiphany of like, I need to be in this thing. So right. I started emailing everybody at Dave Ramsey's company, every contact I had. I was like, I need to be in this, guys. This is my thing. I am your poster child here. Right, right. Like for all three of you, please get me in there. And it was a several month process of what I what I come to find out, I was kind of like a front runner to be in this thing, but they totally pulled my leg the whole time and left it really mysterious and the So you video. just <laughs> you I mean, how did you get in? You just kept you were tenacious with reaching out to his team and yeah i was know. just i mean it was the story it was the it was the the it was it was like it was just made it was it's like they, almost like they came up with it for me right you know it, it, that's not the case but that's that's what it seemed like you know because it was like here's three guys that could take somebody that's like okay follow the principles of what they've done and you can do it too i'm literally like well here i am guys i read your book and i did your stuff and here i am with this right. successful growing business and I've proven to continue to grow it since then. And my company was about half the size at the time that I did the event. So, you know, for me, it was it was amazing because I got to meet all three of them, shake their hands. They're very busy people. They had like, you know, people around them the whole time. But I got to get a little one on one time with them. And then I was up on stage and they grilled me. And it was yeah. talk about the grilling. Soon. Yeah. So how did it how did it start? And then what did they say? Yeah. So basically we got up there and they, you know, they had uh, given me, you know, the opportunity to ask a couple of questions. So I had some questions just about like, 
you know, for particular with Gary, I was like, how do you continue to produce content like this when you're also trying to run a business? Like, how do you balance out that time? You know, and, and questions like that, Dave Ramsey was like, you know, how do you balance out caring for people but also growing the business? And, and uh, I forget the exact questions I asked at the time, to be quite honest with you, but, um, you know, they they just did not pull any punches. Yeah. You know, what they say? Ah, the thing that stuck out to me the most, I wish I had a recording of it. I, don't. I was looking for a recording when I saw it and I couldn't find it anywhere. I don't think they recorded. I think because of the venue that they had, they couldn't do any recordings and stuff like that. So mm. unless somebody happened to grab it on their phone or something, uh, I'm not aware of this any recording. This is the only living recording. So gone. Now you have to, yeah. it's your <laughs> right. memory right now. No pressure. Which I didn't remember much because it was so intimidating being up on stage that I was like trying to take it all in, but it was very difficult. Um, the thing that the key thing that I took away, we were talking about, <laughs> we were talking about how stressful it was to grow the business, and you know, having gone literally from starting it with nothing to now we're at, we're at about forty employees. So every step of the way is constant new things that we've never faced before that we have to figure out quickly train and help others and then it's on to the next challenge so we're kind of like continuously just dealing with new challenges and which is exciting for my wife and I because we run the business together and we're both very much involved in the business but man I tell you it, it is stressful so we were kind of you know complaining I guess you could say up on stage not like whining but we were just kind of talking like hey this is really challenging and all that and they were kind of like well so what like this is what you're doing. Like you can't drive towards growth and then complain about having problems of your growth. Right. And it was kind of like, oh crap, you're right. Like <laughs> we're kind of doing this to ourselves, I guess. So either we need to stop doing this or we need to just suck it up and deal with it. So that was kind of like a big aha for me. It sounds really obvious, yeah. but you know, having three very successful people sit there and basically say like, this is what you signed up for. Like, don't complain about it because this is what it is. Right. And it's like, yeah, that's right. It's not easy for anybody. You know, yeah. my, one of my favorite quotes is from John Maxwell. It says that leadership isn't complicated. It's just hard. <laughs> you know, so it's like the challenges you face running and growing a business, sometimes it can be complicated and hard, but usually it's just straight up hard. And you have to be on board for that. And if you yeah. can get excited about that and those challenges every day, then you know maybe you're cut out for it. But if it's too much and it really stresses you out, you should maybe really think about what you're doing because that is what it is for everyone. Yeah. So Brian, what else did they grill you about or what sticks out? What did they grill other people? Because you could probably take it in maybe a little bit easier when you're watching the other person or two people on stage that got grilled. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting because like when Gary did his session, this was like right when he was starting doing his Ask Gary V show at the time. So he was really kind of latching onto the whole Q&A idea. Yeah. So he literally just threw his keynote out the window and just did a whole Q&A session the entire time. So literally like everybody was coming up on stage and getting to ask him questions. And of course, I was like one of the first ones up there, even though I did the hot seat, I still wanted to get up there and ask him a question. Um, and I, I kind of asked him, you know, in more detail, like, how do you, how do you um, stay in touch and be able to still, like with him, he was in the wine world, right? And I'm in fountain pens. So like, how do I stay in touch with my products at the deep, like subject matter expert level while still trying to run and grow a business? It's almost like I'm trying to do two things at opposite ends yeah. of the whole time. And, you know, there's no magical answer to that. You basically just have to work twice as hard and work, and work two jobs at the same time. That's, that's really kind of it. Um, and that was like, yeah, crap. Okay. So I was kind of looking for like some secret answer. Maybe they'd figured something out and I hadn't. Right. Um, but the big thing that I did pull out of that was like people at higher performing levels like that, especially once your organization gets a little bigger, having an assistant and learning how to delegate really well yeah. really can make a huge difference. And that's actually something I've recently done just yeah. within the last few months. Yeah. I've gotten an executive assistant. And even literally this week as we're recording this, I'm trying to refine and delegate better because one of the biggest challenges I've had, to be completely honest, has been going from when you start at your business, you're doing everything yourself. Like you have to figure it all out. Right. And then when soon as you start hiring people, you have to completely flip a switch and go towards, okay, now I'm mentoring, coaching, inspiring, right. educating these Different people. skill set, yeah. It's a different skill set. I have to teach them how to do it to my standards. I have to define my values when I've never had to do that for myself. Yeah. 
and it's a whole different frame of mind to be responsible for leading people than it is for doing the work yourself. Yeah. So I had to quickly shift gears into that and now I'm kind of having to do both at the same time as I learn my products really well and I'm involved in like high like vendor decisions and product design and stuff like that, but also doing a lot on the leadership side. It's a big challenge. Yeah, huge challenge. Brian, so why now with the executive assistant why not like six months, a year, two years, three years? Why, what made you decide to finally do it now? Um, I waited too long. That's why now. <laughs> I should have done it a lot earlier. Um, but someone must know. have pushed you to do it now. I mean, because you could have waited another year also. I think I have to just. I think I have a really high tolerance for pain. So I waited until now. Uh, a lot of it was due to the fact mm-hmm. that I could just kind of see. Uh, I, you know, I've got enough experience under my belt now to kind of see ahead a little bit and what I'm going to be in for over the next year. And I was like, yeah, I'm really, I'm going to start be holding back my company by what I'm able to do yeah. without getting some, some very serious help. Yeah. And I have a great team that takes care of a lot of stuff, but it's getting to the point where like even just managing my own schedule and calendar and my own, you know, things that I'm responsible for weighing in on the decisions, uh, I need help with that. So that's, yeah. it was kind of, I was feeling it for about a year to a year and a half that I was like, yeah. I probably need an assistant, but I don't yeah. know. And it's complicated too, because I work really hand in hand with my wife. So it's like, all right, now I've got this other person that we're going to have to work that dynamic out. Right. Um, it's worked out pretty well though. We very intentionally hired a very specific, yeah. uh, you know, personality style, communication style and experience. Uh, what who, were you looking for personality wise? So we use a DISC personality profile yeah. here. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the DISC. Uh, if you, in case you're curious, I am uh, a maximum on the uh, the dominant or the whatever. You the are domain, okay. Everyone, yeah, I'm yeah. maxed out there, and uh, and I'm also. I would never by, have guessed that, by the way. Well, I, I would have it. guessed the, the <laughs> detailed one, the, like you'd max out on the detail because you're so detailed with the videos and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a little bit of that and I'm a little bit yeah. of the people side too. I'm yeah. very yeah. low on the stability, believe it or not. So I absolutely hate maintaining and creating stability. I'm a complete disruptor. What's an example of your dominant? Like, give me an example of your dominant um, personality. So, I mean, there's a lot of adjectives they use to describe that like D personality style. Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dominant is probably not the right one. I'm very commanding. So it's like when it comes into, okay, hey, there's this thing that's wrong. There's a situation that's going on. I'm like, all right, let's figure this out. Like I will quickly step up and be like, I will take charge. Let's figure this out. Tell yeah. me what's going on. Da, 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 and it's just supernatural to me. Yeah. Um, you know, the directness, the, um, that's probably a better word to use is yeah. direct. So, you know, Does when it, it comes come from to, military, from your, was your dad in the military? No, my dad was never in the military. Oh, were, um, my dad was an entrepreneur. He had a couple of businesses uh, growing up when I was a kid. So yeah. I think I read military was training. Was that through Virginia yeah, Tech? Yeah, so I went to Virginia Tech. Uh, yeah. Pure coincidence that I wore this, <laughs> uh, this shirt today. We were having school spirit day here at work. And so I, that's why I'm wearing this. But um, I, I voluntarily signed up for the uh, Corps of Cadets at Virginia Tech which is essentially hmm. a military school within the larger university. I gotcha. okay. Virginia Tech and Texas A&M both have that. So think of like West Point, VMI, like that kind of right. thing. It's, it's that within the larger university. So while everybody else is goofing off and having fun, uh, I was marching around doing push-ups, you know, being yelled why, at. Why did you do that? What made you decide to? Um, originally, I was thinking about going into the Army. I had an Army scholarship, um, but... Ultimately, I met Rachel, my wife, really, really young. We were 17 when I met. Wow. And uh, I knew very early on that like, that was it. And I have nothing but respect for our military uh, servicemen and women. But I, just, I knew that it was not my calling to be married with her and be overseas. Yeah, very you know, difficult. This was, I, I met her in 2001. This was like right after 9-11. And I was like, well, we're going to war with somebody over this. Right. You know? and, and it's not that I didn't want to step up to the challenge. It just it didn't feel like my calling. Yeah. Now, obviously, I know what my calling is. It was to do this and start this business with her. So I made the right call there, but um, that was a difficult thing to discern yeah. at age 17, three weeks after I met Rachel. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I'm kind of a visionary in that way, I guess. Um, so the so, executive yeah, I mean, assistant, what personality type were you looking for? 
with the disc I was looking profile. for somebody with a very high uh, C, a very high cautiousness. So somebody who's very detail oriented and also had a lot of directness, not quite as much on the stability front or the people oriented front. Mm -hmm. So Jen is my assistant. She's awesome. Um, we gel really well together. We're very clear and very direct, but I'm very much the decision maker. And she is the one who like does a lot of research, lays out a lot of options, presents things to me. And I'm like, not that, not that, this, not that, not that, that, that. And you know, we don't take anything personally. We're both very task oriented. Mm -hmm. So it tends to work really well. My wife is very much geared that way too. She's maxed out on the directness. Uh, really? A part of a lot of directness so, people around you. Which, which is pretty rare. Only about 10% of the population is dominant in that direct, uh, the D part of the profile. So uh, the fact that Rachel and I both found each other and haven't, you know, killed each other is, uh, <laughs> is pretty good. You know, it's like some people, it's like you're too similar. It doesn't work. Her and I just works really well. And especially you've been together for how long? Uh, 15 years 15 now. 15 years. Yeah. Um, so did you, how did you find your assistant? Uh, well, essentially, we just opened it up, you know, just like a normal hiring process. We open, we, we use referral networks, so we ask out through um, through everybody on our team, have everybody post on Facebook and stuff like that. We reach out through Indeed, LinkedIn, um, you know, Craigslist, you name it. We'll post on a lot of different job sites to try to just open the funnel as wide as we can. And then we've got, you know, very much of the Dave Ramsey style with Entree Leadership. We have like a multi-step interview process so that we just get to know people really well before we hire them because... You just can't sit down in a 30 minute interview and think that you know somebody, you know, and same with them knowing you. It's like you want to get to know each other really well before you come on, which takes yeah. a lot of time. It's like dating. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, it, it, it really makes you um, think about who it is that you're hiring and get to know each other well. So um, Jen actually ended up being a referral from somebody else that was working here. So did you want so. them in house or virtual? Like, did you have an opinion on having them come in the office or be virtual? Yeah, you know what? That's a good question. I thought about that for a while, actually, because I know people that use virtual assistants and can do it pretty successfully. I think there's a lot of advantages to having a virtual assistant. Um, for me, personally, ultimately, I decided that wasn't the route I wanted to go, mainly just because we have a very, um, you know, we've, we've been growing a lot uh, and things change really constantly around here. And I just didn't feel like having somebody virtually like that put a lot of responsibility on me to communicate to that person yeah. a lot. You want people you know? in who's present who can communicate with the team. Yeah, and somebody gotcha. who's like kind of around as things are happening around me and can help to kind of create some order out of the chaos. Yeah. Uh, and I knew that I needed somebody like by my side to be yeah, able to. Yeah, that makes but, sense. You know, it's certainly I can see either one working out. I think a lot of people could benefit a virtual assistant, especially if there's a lot of like research and, and writing related things that are needed. Right. Uh, for me, it was I needed a whole host of different things, um, including physical things like, you know, I deal with products. I'm shooting videos and stuff. So it's like, hey, I need you to get these pens for me so that I can shoot my next video and like physically running around and getting the products. Yeah. That's something a virtual assistant couldn't do. Is there been something hard for you to, you know, sometimes it's when you've been doing it for so long, it's sometimes hard to delegate it and to have them do it. What's been the hardest for you to actually have your oh, assistant God. do? Everything. I mean... <laughs> That's the problem with being somebody who's like very direct, very hands-on. You're very hands-on, or I am anyway. Right. Um, you know, the, one of the biggest challenges starting out a business is you do everything yourself. So right. you continually have to like have a mantra of, can anyone do this besides me? You know what I mean? Because it's right. like you're not going to grow your business yeah. if you are hanging on to things that someone else can do. That was another yeah. big thing that came out of that business gets personal was all of these guys, they were like, we have a whole team of people surrounding you know, themselves of people that can do things yeah. for them. That's a great mantra. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm every single day, like every single thing that I'm doing, I look in my email, I use OmniFocus to organize a lot of my tasks on the Mac. Every single thing that I'm doing, I say, am I the only person that can do this? And if the answer is yes, then I'm like, cool. Okay, I'm good with that. I'm like, if, if anyone else can do this, I should delegate it to them because it's more opportunity for them. It's an opportunity chance for them to grow. It's, you know, investing in other people and it's freeing up my time. Yeah. Now, it's just 
an endless practice of delegation and constantly having to essentially try to work yourself out of a job. Now, of course, right. the flip side of that is you're never going to actually do that because there's so many opportunities that come out, right. especially today and as much as it's going on in online and e-commerce. I'm never going to be bored. So I need to constantly shovel stuff off my plate because more is coming on. It's like, you know, as I'm dumping the water out of the boat, it's filling in faster than I'm dumping it. So For sure. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> so what are those top couple things that when you ask yourself that question, it's a definite yes, you need to be doing that? Um, for part of it is like the brand, you know, uh, just the, being the face of the brand, you yeah. know, it's the Goulet pen company. Yeah. I have, you know, I started out making pens first. I'm very much like kind of a craftsman yeah. at heart. So kind of the importance of like that responsibility, again, that's a theme kind of in my life is I feel responsible. So for me, it's like every customer experience that happens, it's got my name on it. So for mm -hmm. me, it's like being present, being involved and interactive and plugged into everything that's going on to a degree yeah. is important to me. I need to know that it's being done the way that I would do it. So it's that creates a big challenge, but at the same time, um, I think it helps everybody to really have a lot of buy into what's going on around here. So that is that is definitely the case. You know, being involved in videos and things like that, I'll get help on the video planning at times. I'll get help on you know shooting some of the extra footage, B roll, and things like that. Details of the pen that maybe I don't need to be the one holding the pen, but I need to be the one conveying the passion and talking about some of those details that right. other people might miss. I, I layer that in there and then I get as much help as I can in those kind of other things that people can help with. Yeah. So that's a big part of it. Um, definitely from a leadership standpoint, like, you know, we hold weekly company meetings and I get up in front of the whole company. I'm like, hey guys, here's what's going on. Here's this yeah. challenge. Here's this opportunity that we have. And they get to hear it straight from yeah. my mouth. Like I could have somebody up there say the same thing, right. but it wouldn't mean the same thing as it was coming from me. Yeah. So things like that. Other things, you know, I'm involved in certain product developments. I'm involved in, you know, certain uh, things related to, you know, providing feedback to our vendors who maybe only want to talk to the owner kind of thing, you know. So it's yeah. it's things like that where me as the owner or certain financial decisions where I have the whole context, whereas other people don't, um, that I need to be the one ultimately, ultimately responsible yeah. for. And then yeah. just the you know the leadership aspect of things you know we have we have kind of a cascading leadership around here but ultimately the buck stops with me so I have to be the one who ultimately knows what's going on with every team member here and then can help guide our managers and all of our leaders to be able to coach and, and develop others as well yeah Brian I want to hear about your meetings I know you're a fan of Patrick Lencioni and he, I think you wrote the book Death by Meeting yes what days do you have meetings at what point did you decide you're going to actually have I mean just to make the decision to have meetings is a decision yeah. so talk about your meetings yeah yeah so for me I, I hate meetings I'll just straight up say that I hate right. meetings you're direct of um, course you're. pointless meetings you know your yeah. typical kind of like corporate style meetings right but when you have a good meeting it's actually a really exciting thing yeah. which I know that's going to sound you know, some people are going to be cynical out there hearing that, but it really is. When it accomplishes the goal, it actually gets, it actually saves time and, and creates clarity and motivates people to know and be plugged in as to what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. So it, having the right types of meetings uh, is really inspiring. Um, however, I didn't know that starting out this thing. So we first hired people and we started out working in our house. We hired people in our, when we were in our garage and we had a 500 square foot garage and we had seven of us working in there. So wow. we never had meetings because everything that everyone you said, right? you could hear it. So there was no reason to sit and have a meeting because you would just see all out, hey, you know, whatever this shipment came in. Okay, cool, great. You know, and that was it. It's uh, once we moved business out of our house into a commercial space, we started to spread out a little bit. And then what happened is when people aren't in the room, they start to get a little bit disconnected. And then somebody kind of halfway overhears something and then they start to get confused. And it's not anything malicious or malintended. It's simply just that it's not as clear because you're not all together bumping elbows every single day. Right. So it's kind of just things would start to come about and it just didn't really feel the same anymore. And so I had to be like, hey, everybody, come on over here for a second. Let's talk about this. And you said it straight and you're like, okay, now everybody's clear. But even still, it was probably it was probably once we had about twelve people in our company that I started having regular standing meetings. Yeah. Because it was just you know we were coming in and working every day, and people were working kind of siloed in one area and just didn't have any clue what was going on with other people. And so we said, okay, guys, we need to start having you know a regular morning meeting just so that we all know what shipments are coming in today, you know what's going on in social media, just kind of so we can be aware and all be on the same page. Right. 
Um, and we've really evolved that, um, especially once we started to grow to be about 20 people. That's when it really was like, okay, we need to, we need to start having a, a different context of meetings. That's what Death by Meeting is really good uh, describing. Or his book, uh, The Advantage, is even bigger. Yeah. It's like kind of a, more of a capstone book that encompasses Death by Meeting and a lot of his other ones. Right. Um, I highly recommend that to anyone, uh, The Advantage. So um, what happened when we hit about 20 people is we needed to define our company values because we didn't have yeah. it defined and a mission statement and things like that. It yeah. was just, I just kind of reached a point. I read Tony Shea's book, Delivering Happiness, and yeah. about how he Great did book. that. Yeah. I'm an avid reader, as you can tell. Yeah. Um, so I, I read that and I was like, you know what? We could really benefit from that because what was happening is we were, we were getting new people that were coming on board, the ones who didn't work with us back in the garage days and Rachel and I would be tied up in lots of other things and we wouldn't be rubbing elbows with every single team member anymore. So we had new people that were coming on board that just didn't understand where we came from or yeah. maybe didn't get to hear the passion and everything coming the origin from me. story. Yeah. Yeah. So I, we needed to tell that story and have kind of a, you know, a mantra to kind of say continually through our company and then in our hiring process, be able to bring people on board and say, yeah, this is what you're signing up for. This is what we stand for. That became something that I saw was of great value. In retrospect, I wish I would have done that before we ever hired a single person because it would have created so much clarity. But yeah. you, you know, were doing a million other things at the time. So. Exactly. You yeah. do what you can when you realize it. Um, but yeah, that was really helpful. And that's through the process of defining our values. That's where we started doing the, the standing weekly meeting with the whole team. And that has helped a lot. Yeah. And to create clarity, and that's kind of an evolution too. We did, we we've moved it around on different days. We've tried it an hour. We've tried shortening it. Now we literally just yeah. this week we've moved it to a different day. You know, we're constantly trying to yeah. see what's the best thing because I'm yeah. always like a continuous improvement kind of guy. Right. Um, so that that has been a big part of it. And then we have context of different meetings too. So to kind of expand on you, since you brought up Pat Lancioni, um, we do a daily stand up meeting. Um, we actually do two different stand up meetings. So we start out. Um, you know, everybody, every uh, manager, we have different departments here, you know, because we're about 40 people. So um, we have, you know, our media team, which does all of our content and marketing and stuff like that. We have our customer care team. They're the ones, you know, answering phones, email, live chat, stuff like that. We have our fulfillment team. They're the ones that are actually like pack and ship and orders picking and all that. Yeah. We have our inventory team and they are the one placing purchase orders, doing any bookkeeping, um, you know, sales projections, stuff like that. And then we've got like HR and, you know, Rachel and I are kind of floating around all over the place. So um, each of them, each of the managers there will kind of check in with their teams in the morning and then our whole leadership team, all of those department heads will meet just five to 10 minutes every single morning. And we literally stand up in my office uh, and I have them come in my office so that they don't stick around very long uh, <laughs> afterwards <laughs> and uh, no one's too relaxed in there. Uh, so I'm joking, of course. Do, but, like, do some push ups. No. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So uh, we meet in there and it's just like, hey, what's going on today? What shipments are coming in? You know, what calendar changes do we have going on? We've got these meetings. You know, it's a dress up day tomorrow. Tell everybody, you know, that kind of stuff. Just quick things that are like for the day. Yeah. And then they all go out to their teams and do their own stand up meetings. So everybody on the whole team gets on the same page every single day. And then, of course, throughout the day, we've got Slack. We've got all kinds of different inner office communication stuff. But at least everybody's got the same message as far as, like, what's top priority for that day. Yeah. And being in e-commerce, like, I mean, shipments get delayed every single day. Stuff arrives when you didn't expect it. And it's like, oh, my gosh, we got this thing early and no one else has launched it yet. If we launch it today, we could be one of the first ones. Let's do it. Okay, forget this other thing we planned. Let's do this. You know, so it's stuff like that's happening every single day. And then uh, weekly, we do um, the company meeting. So it's about 30 minutes, maybe sometimes a little bit longer uh, for the whole team to get on the same page. And I give some inspiring stories and talk about company history and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we do a weekly, um, what we call a tactical meeting for the whole leadership team. So that's where we talk about 45 to 90 minutes. Um, usually it ends up being more on the 90 minute side of just like, hey, in the next week, these are things that we need to talk about from like a whole company perspective. You know, so it's like, okay, we have uh, development reviews that are coming up, you know, so we need to get on a schedule and what are we going to communicate to our teams about doing these development reviews or something like that. So we'll talk about those, those kind of somewhat tactical issues, but not like super big picture, long-term strategic stuff. Yeah. That's where we save it up for either we do a, like a monthly half day offsite meeting with the leadership team to talk about some of these, you know, mm. strategic things. And we'll do like ad hoc strategic meetings, too, that just involve certain people. Um, and then we do like a big quarterly meeting as well, which is usually facilitated by, uh, you know, a, an actual, you know, person, a c consultant that we use. Um, and those that's usually a full day. Yeah. Each 
Thank you for sharing that, Brian. I mean, these are the details that are so interesting to hear and, you know, the daily running of a company, you know? Yeah. I mean, this is the stuff that, you know, I've read through like, I don't know, 90 business books in the last three years. And uh, so I find these little gems like with right. the advantage and, you know. What you just heard, he just saved you, you know, you know, maybe 500 hours of not reading 90 yeah. business books. Exactly. So thank you uh, for that. What's been the most impactful uh, that's come out of a meeting recently? Oh, gosh. Recently? Yeah. Oh, it's hard to peg. Do you, did you find that like with the quarterly, like bigger ideas come out of that one? Like which meeting do you find maybe um, you find a big impactful idea for the company or changing directions or making big decisions? Yeah, I think those larger strategic ones definitely have a huge impact. Yeah. Um, you know, it's important not just that like we have a leadership team that's really involved and communicate things, you know, out to everyone else in the company, yeah. but that they are bringing everybody else's views to it. Like it's an important job for any leader that's on the leadership team because they are representing their entire department. So they got to make sure, and we got to have a lot of trust built. We have, you know, the whole Pat Lynch, only five dysfunctions of a team. Like we got to be able to call each other out and speak up when there's things that we don't agree with. And yeah. it's my job as the facilitator of those meetings to cause constructive conflict and bring out, right. you know, when I can see somebody's holding something back, right. I'm like, get it out of yeah. here. Like we got to work this out. If you hide it, then it's not going to help anything. Right. So, you know, being able to draw that kind of stuff out. Yeah. Um, but the larger strategic stuff, you know, it, 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 uh, it can really affect kind of the whole focus of our company. You know, for example, if we're looking to hire like some really strategic positions, you know, we're uh, right now, at least of when we're recording this, I'm in the process of hiring a new uh, HR manager. You know, this is somebody that um, I don't, it, you know, my, my current HR manager is, is moving to uh, basically a director position inside our company. And so um, we're looking for a new HR. We don't have anybody with an HR background to move up within our company. We always try to look from the inside first, but right. we just don't have anybody with the skills. So we have to look from the outside. And that's a huge position because we have a strong culture here. This yeah. is somebody that's going to have a role in hiring future people here. So there's impact is really, really deep uh, for that person. So um, that's a really strategic thing. So we're intentionally going about, okay, how are we going to hire for this position? How are they going to be involved? What is, what is it going to be like to bring this person on board? That's a, that's a bigger strategic thing that we might talk about that could really have like a long lasting impact, uh, for our, for our company for years to come. Yeah. 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 That was all that. Thank you for sharing that. I want to go back to yeah. a little bit in the beginning, cause as we talked, it's been a winding journey. And so yeah. talk a little bit about the influence growing up. You said you grew up in an entrepreneurial household. What did that look I like? Did. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because I, re I, I read about these guys like Gary Vaynerchuk and you think about like, um, you know, uh, what's his name? Mark uh, Cuban and, and stuff like that. Who are they like? They're like coming out of the womb, like selling the placenta and stuff like that. It's like they're just that was a really gross analogy. Sorry. But, you know, they're like talking about picking flowers out of their neighbor's gardens and selling it to them. You know, it's like right. I wasn't wired that way. And I think that, you know, that's something that's really kind of glorified in the media, if you will, um, of like these like unicorn blue blood entrepreneur people. And there's definitely some of those, but a lot of people that start businesses aren't that like super high energy, aggressive, you know, uh, sharks out there. I think there's a lot of people that are just, you know, ambitious and really smart and want to are independent and want to run their own thing. Right. They don't necessarily want the spotlight quite as much. So it's not as highlighted on them. So yeah. for me, it was, it's been a process of, you know, I was never a good salesperson, if you will. Yeah. Like I worked retail sales jobs at like Radio Shack back in the day and stuff like that. And I did okay because I'm a, I'm a pretty, you know, you decent person to talk to. Yeah, yeah but I, I don't have that like commission-based like I want to compete and beat you kind of drive in me. It's very much like a, a self-motivated thing. Yeah. It's more driven on like my independence than it is yeah. on wanting to beat someone else. I was never involved in you know, sports teams and stuff like that. You know, I did sports, but it was like the track team where it's like, I just wanted to beat my own time, like that kind of stuff. Right. So I think it's important for me at least um, to know that there's people out there that aren't this like super type A aggressive, you know, entrepreneur that you can still be successful and be happy doing what you're doing without, you know, having to start a business every year and all this kind of stuff. 
So I was actually a pretty reserved kid. I would I played a lot with Legos and Kinects and things like that. I would literally, my wife and, and people that know me well joke because when I was a kid, like maybe eight, ten years old, I would go to the refrigerator and grab a bag of apples and go up into my room and I would build Kinects for like ten hours at a time and never leave my room and just eat apples the whole time I was up. I <laughs> oh, you apples. took it to the snack because you knew it was gonna be you were to be there. Yeah, for like I knew 10 I hours. was not gonna leave my room the entire <laughs> okay. day. So I would bring a food supply for the day. <laughs> that's hilarious. And I would just and that that's how I was wired. I was very introverted and stuff like that. So you look at me now and it's like that doesn't quite seem like you, but this is you know, this is an acquired skill that I have, yeah. the social interaction. So, you know, not everybody has to be like this, you know, salesperson driven kind yeah. of personality. Um, for me, it's been based on uh, more of my independence. You know, my parents raised me to be very kind of independent. They had a um, desktop publishing business back in the 90s. So they had a business out of the house with, you know, old school Mac computers and stuff like that. Oh. They were doing typesetting and graphic design and, you know, stuff like that before it was really a thing. They rolled that up into a print shop and that partnered with and they sold off the print shop. And uh, my dad now uh, power washes houses for a living. Started his own business when I was in college doing that. And I worked with him for a little bit after college doing that. So, you know, they raised me very independently. And even from four and five years old, they had me, you know, stapling yeah. invoices what to manila doing? folders right, for a penny yeah. a piece. And, you know, I had a little, you know, there was a, a, a local company that uh, needed brochures printed up for their franchises. And so at seven years old, I was running basically an overprinting, you know, kind of business, having to, you know, catalog all of the different types of brochures and, you know, orders would come in and I'd have to typeset them and do all that kind of stuff. They taught me how to do all that, but, you know, I was responsible for, for printing all that stuff out and managing it. So from that early age, I was yeah. learning about like, okay, and they would pay me by the piece. And I was like, oh, okay, so if I do this a little more efficiently, right. I can go back and play with my Legos instead, and I'll still get paid the same amount. You know, So they kind yeah. of wired me for that yeah. as a kid. And, and honestly, that was the motivation. That was a lot of the motivation for me starting my business now was I want my kids to grow up in an environment where they're working. You know, I feel like that's really, really important, even more so than some of the academic things that they're going to learn in school. I think getting a good work ethic and understanding what it means to be motivated and be able to tie your efforts towards rewards and performance, yeah. that's a really important life skill that's not necessarily taught in school today. Yeah, yeah. And Brian, that, that was obviously a huge impact on you. What do you do with sure. your kids now? How old are yeah. your kids? No, my kids are my son is six and my daughter is four. Okay, so they're so we have similar ages, age. similar yeah. age, sort of five, five and two. So I'm yeah. curious of what you do or what you will do with them because that was such a big impact, uh, on your childhood and how you grew For up. Sure. Yeah, one of the things, and actually, this is a good uh, to drop another book on you. Yeah, uh, Dave Ramsey talks about drop this. as many He's, books as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Down the, I'm in no affiliation with any of these people, but. Uh, he has a really good book that he wrote with his daughter, Rachel, um, Rachel Cruz, and their book is called uh, Smart Money, Smart Kids. Okay. And so it's a that's actually probably the best uh, like instruction on how to raise your kids to hmm. be smart. And, you know, obviously take it for what you will. Yeah. Anyone who talks about how to raise your kids, there's going to be a zillion different opinions. Right. But right. I pulled out several things out of that book. Well, that check that out. It well. Yeah. yeah, it's a good one. And one of the things he talks about is like, you know, when your kids are young, like, four to six years old, you know, don't teach them about chores and allowances. Talk about commissions, you know, so when they do something, you pay them on the spot and teach them that here's this reward for that thing that you just did. It's instantaneous. You're teaching them how to work. Yeah. And then you take them to the store and they bring their money and they go and buy their toy or whatever with the money that they earned. Right, now right. it takes a while for that to kind of set in. But after a while of doing that, they start to understand the relationship between I put effort in, get paid, and then I can go and spend it on whatever I want. Right. And then it teaches around age six or so. That's when kids start to understand the concept of saving. So that's when you start to teach like, okay, here's this money now, but this thing that you want that costs a little more money, for my son, it's the Lego Millennium Falcon because uh, he's a Star Wars fan. You just brainwashed them because you wanted the Legos, but okay. I'm, I will. I <laughs> wish I was more of a Star Wars fan. Quite honest with you, I'm not a huge Star Wars fan, but the Lego kits are so cool. Anyway, so he's really into it, and I'm like, "That's cool, Millennium 
Falcon is $150. I'm like, that's a bit much for a six-year-old. So I said, okay, one of the things my parents did for me when I was younger is if there was a really ambitious savings goal that I knew was kind of a stretch, my parents would match me half. And so I did that with my son. I said, hey, if you want to save up $75, I'll match you the other $75. Yeah. Yeah. That'll teach you to be a little motivated. So I use that now. And um, we actually have like a little activity chart for both morning time and nighttime yeah. for both kids, yeah. even our four-year-old. We have it on their door with yeah. a little dry erase marker. I think I saw it. Or you posted on Twitter <laughs> how you get your kids to I brush did, your yeah. teeth. Yeah. yeah, I put it up on my Instagram and then yeah. put it on Twitter. And um, that thing, I tell you, it has made a huge difference. I've never been a big like chore chart type person and Rachel and I are not very crafty so you know mad props to all the super parents out there that do all the crafty lists and all that kind of stuff Um, but man I tell you it makes a huge difference because rather than you know barking at our kids every morning brush your teeth like we could never get them to brush their teeth in the morning it just could never happen but as soon as we put it into a list and then the lists becomes the enemy and not them or us so it's like hey have you done your list yet look at your list hey what's the next thing on your list so it's always list this list list not what's wrong with you why aren't you doing this blah 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 so kind of having a third party like that and i'm not a child psychologist or anything like that this is just like a thing that i tried that i see that worked really well my Uh, wife is a child psychologist and she would agree with you on that probably so cool there you go good i'm glad i'm not screwing up my (laughs) i probably am but maybe not on that (laughs) right So, so We did the chore chart thing. So if our kids do all of our chores in the morning, there's like, you know, five. Sorry, we don't call it a chore chart. It's an activity chart. Chore just sounds like a bad thing, right? Activity chart. So if they do all of their bad activities, yeah. they'll get a quarter. And then, my, you know, they've got um, like a little plastic jar that has a um, like a, a digital like counter on the top of it. So when they put the quarter in, it keeps a running tally of how much money is in the jar. Love so it. they kind of know we can say like, Oh yeah, yeah. you're almost at your goal or whatever. And then they're like, Oh, I want this Lego thing or whatever. We're like, well, if you do that, you're not going to be able to get your millennium Falcon or whatever. And he's like, Oh, okay. Maybe not. Okay. Choices. Yeah. Yeah. So my kids, I mean, my son's now got like 20 bucks saved up. My daughter's got close to that as well. You know, she's saving up for something that's not that much money, so she'll probably hit hers pretty soon. She wants this Elsa doll that's like forty dollars, which is insane. But <laughs> hey, I care more about the principle right, and what I'm right, teaching right. them than about the physical prize that they're going to get. At the smart end. money, smart kids. Yeah, one of books that uh, I'm going to have to check that out. We we've uh, read The Opposite of Spoiled. I don't know if you've checked that one out. I think you'll I've like never that, heard one. that one. The Opposite of Spoiled. You'll like that one also. Oh, right, it's similar one. similar stuff in there. So okay. Um, so. You know, one thing I was reading is, I thought was interesting, Brian, is name your price job out of college that you turned down to wash houses. Yeah. What was that name your price job out of college? And um, what did you yeah. end up doing? So I, I went to school. My degree is actually in what's called residential property management. So it's essentially like apartment leasing and how to run, you know, apartment complexes and things like that. A little yeah. bit of commercial real estate in there too. Yeah, and I graduated college in 2006. So if you can imagine, I graduated in 2006, got my real estate license and all that kind of stuff. And I was looking around and I was like, every moron out there who knows how to sign their name can buy a house. Sorry, I shouldn't call everybody a moron, but like like anyone could be a realtor and sell houses in 2006. And I was looking around and I was like, this is not going to last forever. I was like, there is a bloodbath that's going to be coming soon. And I wasn't that into like the financial sector and all that kind of stuff. But I could just look around and I was like, this is not going to go great. And I'm coming fresh out of school and, you know, I'm going to get chewed up and spit out here pretty quickly if I go into this kind of thing. So I had a name your and price offer from a, a local um, – uh, a locally based national, um, whatever, nationally affiliated um, commercial real estate management company. So they they don't own properties, but they basically do all of the commercial leasing contracts. In fact, they're one of the people for ours. But anyway, um, they wanted me to come on and basically name my own price to come on to their company and be a commercial real estate manager and go like tri-state and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah, that sounds all right. But I just thought about it for like a day. And I was like, man, I was like, this is, I mean, maybe I would have done okay there, but it's, you got to wear a suit every day and it involves a lot of traveling. And the higher up you get into these kind of real estate things, you're just traveling all over the the country. And I was like, if I was going to travel and be away from my family, I would have gone in the military. Right. Like that was a huge incentive for me not to go in the military was I wanted to be home and local and be there. This is before I had kids, but I was like, I want to be involved with my kids. 
And so I knew that as a career track, that was going to have a limited kind of window for me. And my dad, <laughs> the senior year of college, uh, my dad started his own power washing company. This is after so, they sold the desktop, the publishing, right, right, the printing, yeah. and then he got into the power washing. Yeah, exactly. So he wasn't like ready to retire, but he was in, you know, he didn't need to have this real high power job. So he wanted to kind of do his own thing. He'd, he'd been working an office job for a while and wanted to work outside. And so he started this company and it was, it was very much in the early stages while I was in college. But um, part of how I paid for, for my school was doing fix it stuff and painting and power washing and doing all this kind of stuff. And so it was a little bit of like proving a business concept to him where he decided to take it full time. And then I decided to come on board with him. We were going to try to scale the business, have multiple rigs running all over the town, you know, washing people's houses and stuff. So I worked with him for the first several years out of college. Nice. Um, and honestly, it wasn't about the money because I, I very clearly could have made more money doing the commercial real estate gig, at least for a while until it all fell through the floor. Right. But um, I saw the opportunity of, you know, getting to work with my dad, right. doing a, an entrepreneurial venture. Right. I didn't have to like front all the cash for it or anything like that. I got all the advantages of gaining right. some of the experience without having to, you know, I was 22 at the time. So it's like, I didn't have any money. You know, I barely scraped out of school without having to take on any debt. Thankfully, I didn't. That's a big theme in my life is no debt, too, uh, which is why I'm such a Dave Ramsey fan, too. But, um, you know, I was able to take advantage of the opportunity to work with my dad and try to scale a business and get to have those customer interactions and do the marketing and do all that kind of stuff yeah. without having to do everything from scratch. And so I was able to learn so much from my dad, plus just have such precious time with my dad that I will frankly never really have again of working side by side right. with him as his peer and his partner. Um, I got to do that for a couple of years before we realized it's a seasonal business. It had some scaling issues and stuff like that. Ultimately, it wasn't what I was meant to do. But because of the seasonality, I was able to then, you know, pick up a side hobby, which mm -hmm. was another passion of mine, which was woodworking. And then this is where the, yeah. the winding path starts. Yeah. To so how does how does woodworking lead into pens? Yeah, so that's a great question that most people would not make the connection. So um, at the time when Rachel and I got married, we had, you know, minimal amount of money <laughs> and uh, we didn't have cable or anything like that. So we had like four channels on rabbit ears and I'd always been into like tools and stuff like that, but I didn't really know what I was going to do with them. I was just like, you know, when I was 16, 15 years old, I would go to Sears and like shop for hammers and stuff like that instead of hanging out at, you know, the movie theater or whatever. That was just my thing. I figure right. I'm a very utilitarian person. I was like, I'm going to buy a hammer and have this for the rest of my life. <laughs> That's a really good use of my money as a teenager. Very practical. And super practical. So I graduated college with like an, a whole workshop of tools basically, you know. And so when I first got married, I was like dying to do something with these tools. And um, we had PBS on these rabbit ears with Norm Abram and the New Yankee Workshop. And he's since the show has been canceled for years now, but it was a like 21 or 22 year running show. Wow. And he would build like these, these replicas of these antique pieces of furniture. And it was just like captivating to me. And I was like, I want to build this so bad because it spoke to like the craftsman in me. Uh, however, when you're living in an apartment balcony, just married and you know, you can't really be building like 18th century armoires and stuff. And so I was like, what could I possibly build with my limited funds mm -hmm. and the need to not create a whole bunch of noise. So I disrupt my neighbors. And so I just, I had a, you know, a woodworking catalog and I saw there was like one page in the catalog where it had pen turning. So it was like a small lathe that you could buy and some small tools and, and uh, lathe chisels and stuff to be able to turn pens out of wood. And I was like, well, that's kind of so cool. So turn pens, for people who don't know and myself, what does that mean, turning pens? Like you literally make a, what are you making? So essentially, if you think about a pen, like I have a pen yeah. right here, right? The body of the pen and the cap of the pen are essentially, you know, a straight shaft with whatever, you know, pen refill or whatever that goes through it. Right. So when you're making a pen out of wood, you're essentially drilling a hole through the piece of wood. Yeah. You're gluing a brass tube inside there to help reinforce the wood. And then you put it on the lathe, which spins it around. And then you essentially chisel it away into whatever shape that you desire. 
and then you press the other pieces into it, so the writing piece and all that stuff, you yeah. press that into the wooden pieces. Oh, I gotcha. You end up with a pen with the the, the, uh, the majority of it that looks in its actual wood. Yeah. So to me, that was so cool. And I was like, it's functional. It is beautiful. I can do it. It's quiet enough where my neighbors won't complain. We only got one letter of complaint uh, the whole time we were doing it. And uh, it was funny because like, I mean, I'm sure I violated every rule in the agreement for the apartment complex and all that. I was draping extension cords out the window and running lights wow. and everything, you name it. it was, I'm sure I was breaking some codes somewhere. Um, just I hope those, I hope it's been long enough now where they can't prosecute me for anything. But That's no proof. Um, you know, I just, it was a proof of concept for me. And I started doing it in the first day that I made pens. I turned four different pens that, you know, looked pretty shoddy, but it was, it was fun and I was figuring out how to do it. And as soon as I turned the pens and I pressed it together, I was like, I just created That's something. That's pretty cool, yeah. I was like, this is cool. And then I made four pens in like three hours, and I was like, what am I going to do with all these pens? <laughs> I was like, my hobby has already ended because I have more pens than I'm ever going to use. <laughs> what am I going to do about this? I was like, I got to sell pens. Like, I got to sell pens just so that I can continue to make them as a hobby. So I was like looking around and just, I didn't know anything about business, you know, other than commercial, you know, real estate type stuff. But I didn't know anything about, you know, selling products like that. So I um, just started asking around and looking at craft shows and stuff like that. And I'm not joking, like two or three weeks, this is a complete windfall. Two or three weeks after I started making these pens, the company that my wife was working for, one of the VPs there who was responsible for buying their client corporate Christmas gifts, they were always giving out like the cross pens, you know, with the name engraved on it and all that kind of stuff. And he got wind that I was making wood pens. And he was like, well, that's kind of cool. Wood pens seems kind of interesting and different. Mm -hmm. So he was like, can you bring up some of your pens that you made? I made like nine or ten pens at that point. And they're, the finish is not good. And I haven't really figured it out that much. But it was, a, again, a concept. So I brought him up there and I was like so proud. I was like, here are my wood pens. It's cool. And he's like, well, these look a little rough. But he's like, if you could figure out how to make them, you know, I'd like to get 120 of them in the next two months. And, I, and he was like, do you think you could do that? And I was like absolutely I can do that <laughs> so I was like I'm gonna figure out how to make these pens look good and then make 120 of them and then immediately it was like Rachel and I were just like shoot we don't like know how to file taxes we don't have a business name or anything we gotta like figure all of this out as we go here so we're we just start like we're like all right I guess we're running a business now and so I just kind of like stumbled into the whole business of it and um, you know so I started doing that we started doing some trade shows craft shows stuff like that we did okay with it but it never really like caught on because it was a gift it was a gift crowd you know this was in 2007 2008 2009 a lot of corporations and stuff started yeah. cut back they stopped yeah started cut back you know gifting really really cut back and it was just viewed as a non-essential thing so even as cool as it was nobody was buying it anymore so around 2008 2009 i was like what am I going to do here? You know, and a, my fallback plan was, well, Rachel's got a decent job. She was working at Capital One because they're local here in Richmond. So she was working at Capital One, pulling the wagon financially. And I was the one kind of messing around with my pens. And I was like, well, the fallback plan is I'll be the stay at home dad and she'll make the money and I'll just be a at home dad. That's cool. I wanted to be with my kids anyway. So this is cool. Um, then mid-2009, I just catch wind from a pen-making friend of mine that there's this fountain pen show up in Washington, D.C. And I'm like, okay, I've, I've heard of fountain pens, but I literally had never used one before. And the way that the kit pens work that I was actually using to make these wooden pens, they would have the parts that you could change out where it could be a rollerball pen, like normal one, or you could put in a fountain pen thing. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I could make the same pen and just sell a fountain pen, whatever. I'll go scope out the show, and maybe it'll be a good opportunity for me to make some connections or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I go to the show in 2009. Again, didn't know a single thing about fountain pens. And I go to this show and there's like, there's a couple thousand people that go to this show. It's a very heavy vintage pen crowd because fountain pens have been around for about 150 years. So there's a lot of people that have these really old pens and they're super enthusiastic. I'm not joking. They wear fishing vests because they're in like photography uh. vests covered in pockets and they have pens filling their pockets. Right. And you're just like, who are these people? And you know, coming from like the corporate gift crowd, it was like you would sell to like one person that makes the purchase for the clients, the pens go out to the clients, 
and then you never hear back from anybody again. You're right. always cold calling, trying to drum up more business. There's no community or of, of enthusiasts that are into this stuff. Right, right. It's just gifts that then you scatter to the wind. So I go there and I see this community of fountain pen people that are like super into it. And I'm like, this is what I've been missing. I was like, I got to figure out what's up with these fountain pens because these people are into them. And if they're that into them, there must be a reason why. Right, so right. I started looking online. I bought like a, my first bottle of ink at the show. I spilled it the first time I tried to fill a pen. I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. So I started searching online and I was like, what information is like, I'm, I want to get into fountain pens, but how do I do that? So I found this forum called the Fountain Pen Network. And, you know, it's, it's a typical like message board type form, nothing fancy, right. um, but it had, you know, a very vibrant community at the time. I think it had about 45,000 members. I think it's closer to a hundred thousand wow. now. Um, so it's, it's a pretty solid yeah, community. Yeah, big community, yeah. Yeah, but it's all like, you know, very special interest around these fountain pens. So I look on there and I'm like reading stuff, but you don't really know who the people are. As a new person, you don't know who these people are and they're recommending stuff and using all these abbreviations and you don't know what's going on. So you're like trying to sift through all this information. And I look and there's not really any videos. This was again in 2009. So it's not like YouTube was new, but at the same time, it wasn't like everybody. You know, people who are fountain companies. pen enthusiasts aren't rushing to YouTube to make videos most likely. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So people like Gary Vaynerchuk who started doing videos in like 2006, they were like the bleeding edge. But in 2009, it still wasn't like understood that like oh yeah if you're a business and a special interest you're gonna have a youtube channel or anything it's not it's not assumed like that so i'm looking around and i'm like man it, it took me so long just to scrap together the information i needed to be able to learn how to effectively use fountain pens and i was and that's that's right around the point where i uh read crush it by gary vaynerchuk and i read his story and what he did in the wine world and i was like you know I was like, there's an enthusiast community of fountain pen users just like there is wine. It's a much smaller community. But man, I was like, I have this, even though he had already done it and he'd already like dominated the wine world, I was like, there's nobody in the fountain pen world that's done this yet. I could literally just copy the techniques that Gary has used and do it in the fountain pen world and I would be like this big innovator, right? Yeah. Come to find out, you know, I had the disadvantage of not knowing anything about fountain pens. So I was like, well, this is going to be a challenge. It's like, okay, so I need to simultaneously become an expert and then also gain a following, which is a very difficult thing to do, I must say. Gary Vaynerchuk had been into wine since he was like yeah. 15 or something. So he already had like 20 years experience by the time he started doing his videos. I did not have, I had like two months of experience. And I was like, okay, there's a lot of fountain pen people that could like chew me up and spit me out when it comes to the technical knowledge of pens. So I'm going to have to really stick to what I know well and not try to be more of an expert than I really am, but really learn deep the things that I do and then put it out there. So I focused on an area that not was not getting a lot of attention. So even within the fountain pen community, there was a, a sub community of people who were really into ink and paper. Okay. Like I never thought you were going to go into a sub community of the fountain pen. This is. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's how I got my start. For the first full year of the business, I didn't sell a single pen. It was all ink and paper for fountain pen use. So there were tons of people, especially a lot of brick and mortar stores that had set up websites and stuff like that, that knew more about pens than I could ever hope. But I knew that ink and paper was like too small time for a lot of these pen companies to really worry about. So I was like, yeah, I'll shoot a 15 minute video on a $5 notebook because I'm the only one that's going to be there. It's going to build up my credibility and it's going to allow me to quickly sell products because I need to make money, right? So um, I found that was a niche within a niche. Wow. And I said, okay, I'm just going to have to learn every single product inside and out. And time after time, as I do that, eventually I'll amass a lot of knowledge and gain a following. And then eventually when I get to the point where I get into pens, I'm going to have a lot of credibility. I'm going to do the same kind of thing. And then I'm going to become unstoppable. And that's essentially in the last seven years what I've done yeah. is I started out with the humblest of beginnings, spending an unbelievable amount of time and effort to learn the products that no one cared about. Uh, from a retailer standpoint because it was too small margin and just you know it was just not worth the effort to them I focused on those first gained a huge following and community so that when I as I got higher and higher end and got into pens and some of the more you know profitable things uh, it was more natural and now it's to the point where 
you know, anybody who's looking to get into fountain pens, they come to my store because they, we have such a huge resource yeah. for new people getting, and then all that's been very much driven by the fact that it was so hard for me to first get into it, even as passionate and as, you know, well-researched as I was trying to find this information, it just yeah. wasn't really out there and well put together. So I did things like I put together like a fountain pen 101 series, which is like four years old at this point and probably needs to be updated. But still, I put together like everything I knew in the first three years of my fountain pen knowledge. And I put it together into, you know, just over about an hour and a half, maybe two hours worth of videos in this whole series. So if you want to learn about fountain pens, you watch this two hours of videos and you'll save yourself three years of full time research because I put all that in there. So, but think about it, though. It's free information that's out there. Anybody who discovers this, they get into it. My face is the first one that they'll see. They become like super enthusiastic because you just you rocket past all of the hardships of getting into a hobby like this, right. and you immediately start to get to the gratifying parts of it. You know what I mean? Imagine like being able to play a musical instrument. You watch like a two-hour video, and it's like you've been playing the instrument for three years. Right. Like it would be unbelievable, right? Like you would totally do that. So it's the same kind of thing with fountain pens for these videos that I put together. And then because of that and because it's now like a, almost like a transformation that people have had in their lives being able to use these nice pens and then everybody knows how to write for the most part. So it's like it's a, such a better writing experience that it's like opening up a new world to them and who opened up that world? I did. So like the loyalty and the trust that they yeah. feel is like unbreakable. I'm not joking. I have, and you know, there's competitors of mine, like Amazon is a big one and they always go low on price and stuff like that. I'm not joking. I've had people that have watched my videos and have then, you know, shopped a cheaper price on Amazon and they felt so guilty that they have literally mailed me a check for the difference in the price of what they paid on Amazon because they felt they owed me that wow. based off what I taught them through these That's videos. That's crazy. It's, it's crazy like how loyal people get from this education. Yeah. But that's been like a staple of mine from the very beginning. Uh, and it still continues to drive me today. Even as busy, as crazy busy as I am, I still am making time week in and week out to shoot these videos. You know, whether it's, yeah. you know, YouTube videos like I'm doing or I do Periscope, you know, I'm doing live stream videos. I'll do, you know, any of that kind of stuff because... For one, it keeps me rooted and it keeps me feeling real because when you're, you know, running a business of 40 people, it's easy to get a little ivory tower mentality and protect yourself from people. But when you, man, when you go live streaming and people are firing questions at you, it's like there's no hedge walls of protection there. You got to be like, you got to be legit, you know, to be right. able to do that. So it keeps me real, um, but also it keeps me connected and it keeps other people connected to my brand too. So Brian, what, when did you see a lot of traction with you. I mean, you have 46,000 YouTube subscribers, right? Yeah. So what helped you get to that point? Because there's people who produce content all the time um, for many years and they don't gain that type of following. Yeah. What helped you gain the most traction with YouTube? Um, honestly, probably the number one thing that I can attribute to that success has been persistence. Um, there's no one video that I've done that's gone viral. Was there a point in video. the time, like what time period? Was it just a slow progression okay, over time? Yeah, yeah. Or? No, it was a slow build. It yeah. was a slow build. In fact, the amount of views, likes, comments, whatever you want to say now yeah. that I get in a five-day period is as much as I had in the first year yeah. of shooting videos. I mean, I think I watched one. You had, There were 62 comments on it for, yeah. for a pen video. Oh, that's actually fairly low. Yeah, I mean, whatever one I was I was looking at, and yeah. I'm like, there's 62. I mean, there's a lot of interaction there. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, it's not anything on. I didn't realize that was low. I thought that comments. was high. Yeah. But. yeah, I mean, it's a very engaged community. That's one. It's a very niche community, but yeah. man, it's like you're hitting right where people are spending a lot of their time and passion, yeah. right? So they're super, super engaged. And if you meet people where they are. Uh, it just generates conversation. People love talking about the things that they love. So, you know, if you can do that and you can continue to serve them in that way, they're going to comment like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you can shape your content based off the comments you're getting, that's a big Gary Vee thing too. Oh, man, they really love that. <laughs> What's your process for content creation? What separates the ones that get, I'm like, I was looking, one of them, you know, gets 15,000 views, like the... Uh, I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. Namiki Maki E Fountain Pen Overview is 15 yeah. over 15,000 views, and another one has 5,000. 
What's yeah. up, what have you found separates the ones that have a lot more views from from that? Yeah, sometimes you can't really tell, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the ones the ones that have done really well have either been, you know, products that are in high demand, but there's not a lot of good information about them. Like mm -hmm. we have certain products like Midori is a brand that we carry based out of Japan. And that video has got, I don't know, 200,000 views or somewhere thereabouts. Um, it's because it was talked about with a lot of bloggers and stuff, but there was no good resource of like, here's what this notebook system is and here's how it works. Yeah. So it was like an educational style video on this thing that was very in high, in high demand. Yeah. Um, and that video has gained a lot over the years just because it's the best res one of the best resources out there to explain this. Other ones, they can be a little more entertaining. Like we've got one that's like the seven worst mistakes you can make with your fountain pen. It's got like 150,000 views in the last two months. Wow. Because uh, it's very entertaining and it's, you know, it's a listicle, you know, the, you can look at BuzzFeed and stuff like that. People love listicles, mm -hmm. you know, so doing things like that, having a little bit of entertainment production value. And so we'll mix stuff like that in there. And then I'll also have like really deeply technical stuff about new products that we're carrying or yeah. um, the ones that tend to do really consistent Consistent and are you know not not like through the roof, but get a decent following. You know, five, six, seven thousand views. I do a weekly Q and A. Yeah. So every week I'm posting questions on Facebook and you know Instagram and stuff like that. We gather up those questions. I pick you know five or seven of them, and then I post a video on YouTube every Friday. So it's real questions that I'm getting from people, and I've done. I just recorded my hundred and thirty second one. Wow. So you know I've got. Yeah, the 16, Q and A's are good. Sixteen hundred questions or something that I've answered now. Jeez. It's probably to the point now where I'm answering questions I've answered before and I just can't remember. <laughs> right. You know, but I figure if I can't remember, nobody else can either. So it's okay. It's a good as reminder. As long as they, you know, enter, answer it, answer it correctly and in, in, in an entertaining fashion. Um, what you know, are some but, of your best sellers? What are some of the best selling products? Some of the best selling products, um, definitely pens are, you know, the bulk of what we do. Um, but we do move quite a bit of ink and paper as well. Um, so for sure, pens. The, the inks that tend to do really well are some of the newer, like, kind of special inks, the ones that have, like, glitter and stuff like that in them. Um, just, you know, really unique and interesting stuff. Permanent inks tend to do pretty well, too, because people like to be able to write in the rain and stuff like that and not have it get ruined. Um, the pens that tend to do best, some of the, like some of the better pens we've had have been, um, like, uh, Lamy is a brand out of Germany. It's a good, what's called like a workhorse pen. You know, it's attractive pen, but you can also carry it around. It's a very reliable writer. You know, it comes in lots of different colors. So those tend to do pretty well. So, um, but there's no like one product or one brand that is just far and away the yeah. best. You know, it's typical kind of like 80-20, you know, rule, just as you would have with pretty much many things in life. You know, about 20% of our products make up about 80% right. of sales. Right. Um, but it's a pretty decent spread across uh, across some of the brands. So the ones where there's like lots of interesting colors or it's a brand, you know, like Visconti is a brand that we have. It's out of Italy. You know, they come up with their higher end brand, but they're very innovative. So they're coming out with new designs all the mm. time. So it keeps people really engaged, really excited, wanting to collect their stuff. Yeah. That tends to do pretty well, too. Yeah. You know, so Brian, for that, uh, obviously a lot of traction through social media, right? Your Instagram. Yeah. I mean, I think you have 16,000 Facebook fans, 46,000 YouTube followers. What else yeah. works for for selling the pens, driving people? Yeah, I mean, honestly, even to this day, we do very little paid advertising wow. of any kind. It's, it's amazing. all content and engagement. Yeah, Jeez. I mean... Yeah, thank you. I actually, it's funny because what I'm told by others, is, yeah. I'm ignorant, but what I'm told by others is that the content stuff is harder to do. Uh, and then it's a lot easier to just do pay per click and banner ads and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm. They're like, imagine what you could do with pay per click. Is that what they're saying? Yeah, like I'm kind of the opposite. I'm like, I don't really know anything about pay per click. So for me, I'm, yeah. I'm ignorant. So it's a higher risk to do that. Yeah. Um, and plus, I haven't really needed to. So I'm, I'm, I'm not yeah. like against ever doing that, but I just yeah. we've been growing at such a click that I haven't even wanted to do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for me, it's been because I started out having like no money. <laughs> You know, my I wasn't even working a paying job getting into this business, you know, and I didn't even mention this earlier, but at the time that we started this business, my wife was seven months pregnant with our son. Wow. So she launched, you know, she, uh, we launched the business. It just started to do some stuff. It was like, I, sh I recorded my first video 10 days before our son was born. And, um, you know, she was on maternity leave and then basically decided that she couldn't go back. 
And I was like, really? Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> like, I was like, we didn't really talk about that before. I, that's not what and we I had like, we had some money saved up, but we had a mortgage, we had a baby and this business that at the time was not doing, it was not profitable at that point. Yeah. So I was like, oh boy, okay. So can we really make this work? So we crunched some numbers and we were like, all right, we've got about a seven month window here where we have to make this business work yeah. or it's going to die. Right. And so we were like, all right, it's going to be all or nothing. So right. she quit a job and the two of us worked like 120 hours a week or something crazy like that. I'm not joking. Uh, to try to get this business off yeah. the ground in the first, you know, seven months or so. And it got to the point where it did work and we had traction and that's where, it, I mean, I'm not joking. This was like two months after I started shooting videos when I had no following and when there were no guarantees of any kind. Yeah. And I was like, could we really make this work? And I was like, well, I think we should try to do it now before we get older and wiser as to how hard this is really going to be. Right. I was like, let's go for it. And we, for Big nothing decision. else, we're gonna yeah. do it through pure sheer will, we'll make it happen. And it did. So what were some of the milestones? Obviously, initially, that first corporate order where you had to make 120 pens <laughs> yeah, by yourself. Was what was the sure. next uh, major milestone? The, yeah, the next major milestone after there was going to that, that pen show in, in 2009 and realizing that I needed to, essentially, I needed to pivot my entire business model. Yeah. Um, at the time, I actually thought I was going to start selling ink and paper so that I could then sell my handmade fountain pens. Right, right. For a variety of reasons, making wooden pens as fountain pens doesn't work. They're too heavy and the metal sections are all shiny and don't ha handle as well. So that didn't work out. So I, I really had to essentially completely give up my pen making career, which I had been doing it for three years at that point. And I had visions of being a 65-year-old master pen craftsman. And I had to just completely kill that dream for practical reasons and say, okay, I'm going to become a YouTuber and ink and paper salesman. You know, I, I guess I can get on board with that. And, uh, and then the next milestone, which is very quickly after that, was when Rachel quit her job. And I was like, all right, we are, we are diving headfirst into this thing. You know, and we did it intelligently, but it was still with a decent amount of yeah, risk. That's a huge amount of risk, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, with great risk comes great reward. It wasn't right. a it wasn't the kind of a like a, a risk that if we failed we would jeopardize the livelihood of our family. Sure. Like had she had a fallback plan, I you know I'm sure I could have gone out and gotten a job somewhere doing something. Right. Um, so it's not like we were going to be destitute, but at the same time it was like it was really on the line yeah. for a while there, and we just something about like having a kid and like okay I'm now responsible for this life that can't take care of themselves at all like the dad like provider genes like super kicked in and I became like the incredible Hulk <laughs> to work right and then like her quitting her job and like okay like there is absolutely no lack of clarity about what I need to be doing for the next year right. I need to work my tail off harder than I ever have or ever will yeah and at that point, it was almost easy because there was no there was no decision to be made. It was like this has to work. So every single thing to make this business work is the thing that I'm going to be doing. Yeah, yeah. So, so what was, was next after yeah. that? What was the next major milestone? The next big milestone after that was probably hiring our first employee. Yeah. Because my ultimate dream was kind of like what my parents did when I was a kid. They they worked in the house. I grew up, you know, until I was around 11 years old, my parents had their business in the house. And then they, they merged it into a print shop and sold it off and stuff like that. Um, so I grew up for like 10 years as a kid with my parents at home yeah. and getting to work side by side with them and stuff like that. So that was kind of my original dream. Right. I didn't really know I would grow it into a business like this. Um, so I really kind of kept that as my original vision was like Rachel and I would work in our house and have our two kids and even when we like went to hire we we needed to hire somebody I resisted it for a while cuz I was like I don't really want to manage people I like doing the work right. um, until we were working 18 to 20 hour days 7 days a week wow. and I was like I can't even get sick as in, like not right. forget vacations like I can't get sick because I'll get a week behind in my work right. I was like this is not a sustainable operation for me. <laughs> I was like, what do you hire first for? 
Um, we hired a, a fulfillment person, so somebody to just help us in the warehouse to fill orders because yeah. it was, you know, a simpler job, you know, and uh, it was something that, that I could train away relatively quickly. Um, even still, that first person that I hired, I made them pack orders next to me for a solid month before I let them ever touch an order. Wow. So it seems silly now, but that's how that's how much I cared about how it should be done. Right. Um, you know, so I, people you know, were finding you and buying because of your videos at the time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I was doing the video thing, and I was packing all the orders, and I was doing a lot of the customer correspondence, and then like a lot of the you know Rachel was handling a lot of the administrative stuff, so she was doing a lot of the order processing, filing taxes, dealing with all the paperwork and stuff like that. Yeah. So the two of us were really working together at that time. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I was kind of doing it all. So you go, Brian, from dining room table to 500 square feet in your garage to yep. what was the ne- what were the next growth spots? Yeah. So the next after that, after hiring, um, so we hired our first person, and then within six months we had uh, five people, not including my wife and I, because we were we were growing, and it was like once I kind of figured out like oh other people can do this stuff and it gets done pretty well and I can spend more time blogging and being the product expert and stuff like that, like clicked with me and I was like, oh, well, duh, like this is how it should be done. And so um, we hired a bunch of people and it got to the point where we had so many people in our house. I was like, you know, I wonder what the county code is for how many people you're supposed to have working out of your house. You know, we're in a pretty laid back rural county, but I looked up and it was like, no more than one non-family member employee out of your home-based business. And I was like, crap, I'm already like breaking the law here. And I was like, Rachel, I think we need to look for some other options. I mean, I'm not joking. At the time, we were looking at like maybe we'd build another garage on the side property, maybe right. another house with a 2,000 square foot garage. Like that was my like limited understanding of where this thing was going at the time. But as soon as I looked up the county code, I was like, shoot, Rachel. I was like, we got to get a real space here. And that's when it was kind of like, I mourned a little bit, honestly, because I was like this dream that I had. I already killed off my dream of being a pen craftsman. And then I had to say like, oh, this dream of like raising my kids in the house with the business. Right. It's like not an option anymore. Now we have to go commute. I have to like change out of my pajamas to get work done. Like this is going to be terrible. <laughs> but at the same time, I was like, you know what? This thing is growing. It's exciting. And it was like not everybody gets the opportunity to do this. Right. And I considered it a huge blessing to be able to work like this. Honestly, I think, you know, Teddy Roosevelt says, there's no greater thing in life to work hard at work worth doing. And I was like, this is work worth doing. And it's super like inspiring to be doing, it's hard work, but it's really good work that right. helps people and provides jobs for people in, in my local area. And I was like, that's really cool to be a, to be a part of that. And I was like, you know what, even though it's different than my original dream, it's still achieving my greater purpose of, you know, stewardship. Like, I feel like I've been given a lot of things in life and I'm to make the most out of it yeah. through my own work and, and efforts and discipline. Yeah. And that drives me even still today. Like, we're at the point now, I'm not joking, we're outgrowing the space that we're in. And I'm having to make decisions of like, man, do we try to make it work? I mean, it's crazy. We're outgrowing 12,000 square feet of space. And we got people like tripled and quadrupled up in offices and you name it. It's crazy. We have a kitchen that we've had to turn into a storage room and it's, it's pretty bizarre where we are now. But so I'm looking at larger spaces and I'm looking at spaces that are double the size that we are now with a five year lease. And I'm like, this seems crazy. But at the same time, I'm also like, are we even going to outgrow this in five years? It's for me to say, you know, I have to like five years ago, I had one employee one and now I have to say what am I going to be like five years from now I don't really know but I have to figure it out and everybody's looking to me to be like have the answers right so it's like no pressure there Um, but it's fun at the same time it's a balance between having a plan but also being super fluid and adaptive towards the reality that is undoubtedly going to be different than whatever it is you plan for so Brian since this inspired insider I always ask what's been the lowest moment and how you push through and then what's been the proudest so what's been the lowest moment, a tough time? That's, uh, that's an easy one. Well, <laughs> I've had a couple, actually, um, related specifically to the business. I've had some personal stuff go on. I won't get into that. But related specifically to the business, it would be that event, Business Gets Personal. So here I mm. get to meet my idols, the people who have helped me to achieve this incredible thing. We're in New York City, and it's amazing. And literally that trip was one of the hardest trips Mm. for my wife 
that she's ever had. Really? She's struggled with anxiety. It's uh, something that runs throughout her family. She's a very hard driving, hard performing individual, just like myself. Um, but, you know, at times she's been crippled from anxiety of overworking herself and to the point where she physically, like, can't work. And um, she, at that time, this was several years ago, she's worked through a lot of that now, but it's not been without its challenges. So when, when we went to that event in New York, I'm not joking, she was like, you know, sick in the bathroom at the airport, you know, just thinking about even getting on the plane. Mm. And so here it is, I'm going to this event where I get to meet my icons and get honored as being this amazing, you know, rocket ship of a business. And yet I was barely able to get her out of bed to go to the event with me to be honored for this. Mm. And that feeling of, I have this incredible thing that I feel super fulfilled and called to do that is also like killing my wife. And that was like both a high and a low point for me, like I've never had in one single event before. Yeah. And it, it's affected, you know, uh, the way, the strategy, the way we've grown our business, because I think at the time, you know, Rachel's a lot more introverted than I am. She likes to be more behind the scenes. She's very task driven and not very people like leadership oriented. So um, it, we've had to have some like very hard realizations that she's not going to be the front person of the business like I am. And she's not going to be the right. leader take charge person. She's extremely capable in many different areas. And believe me, she is like the oil that greases everything around this company. Right. But she doesn't have any direct reports because the whole direct managing thing is like just not her thing it just creates right. so much anxiety for her yeah so to realize like both her and I are so aligned and so strong you know together but to feel like that rift of kind of like yeah we need to be very much serving in different yeah. ways that was a that was a really yeah. hard period for us for several years because and then still it's like there's still work that needs to be done you know we're still growing and we we're hiring people and all this kind of stuff and we had to kind of figure that out and it took us several years to really work through all of that, but it's still a challenge. Yeah. It's still yeah. something she has to fight today because, yeah. you know, everything is trade-offs. It's fairly it's common. Of a lot of people have that. There's you know, so many yeah. business business entrepreneurs that struggle with anxiety, and it's amazing because it's not talked about very much. And it's very, especially with guys, it's very macho of like, oh, yeah, I'm like this invincible person. It's like, no, actually, there's so many people a lot of pressure. that struggle. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of it's just pressure you put on yourself, you yeah. know. Um, Rachel, she doesn't really give much of a crap of what other people think of her, but it's it's about what her, she, it's, she doesn't want to be a failure. You know what right, I mean? Right. Like that's a huge. Yeah. That's a huge thing that is a struggle for high performers. So Brian, on the flip side, one of the most proud, you know, one of the proudest. Oh gosh, proudest moments, huh? There have been not a lot of proud moments, honestly. Um. That's a good question. I think of a proud moment. Um, for me, it hasn't been like any one single event probably that's been like, oh, this is the proudest day I've ever had. Um, I think for me, it's about uh, everything that drives me is about leading by example. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I put a lot of pressure on myself. That's why I read so much material is because I know, you know, uh, John Maxwell has this concept called the leadership lid, says that you're always going to be, as the CEO, you're always going to be the lid for your organization. Mm. So in order to grow your company, you have to grow yourself. Yeah. And that like strikes me to the core. So I'm like, I have to continually make myself better, more competent, yeah. capable, more caring, more empathetic, smarter, all around so that I can provide better direction and leadership to all my team. I think one of the things um, that's been most gratifying now, having invested several years into members of my team, is uh, seeing how things run when I'm not here. Hmm. You know, definitely I spend a lot of time bringing my, my special magic, you know, and I spend a lot of time delegating and, and only spending my time on the things that I can do, like this interview, for example. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like when my team is taking care of stuff and I get to see them start to excel in ways that even I couldn't, you know, like somebody who's a little stronger relationally than I am, you know, help to mediate 
uh, two people that are having a miscommunication mm. in a way that I know that I even couldn't, but mm. I know I provided leadership to that whole situation. Right, right. That to me, in a very non-flashy way, yeah. is like so deeply satisfying yeah. knowing that I'm affecting and helping grow people yeah. in their own personal development, leadership, and opportunities. It's like, it's, 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 it's something that I didn't expect yeah. when I first started this company. But it's something that as I'm going along, I'm like, wow, this is like fruits of labor that yeah. I could not have even foreseen, but I'm I'm driven towards accomplishing more of that yeah. now. Yeah. So Brian, I know we're right at the time. Tell <laughs> people where can they find out more, where th- where should they go? Absolutely. So my website is gulepens.com. Uh that's G O U L E T. Pens. Pens. Yeah. Com. Or you can just search fountain pens, Goulet, or whatever, and you'll He's find it. He's all over the internet, yeah. All <laughs> over the place there, especially YouTube. Um, we're pretty active on Instagram, too, so you can check out Goulet Pens on Instagram. Yeah. Any, We name all of our different profiles with Goulet Pens, so you should check Twitter, you can check um, you know, Periscope, you can check Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube. Facebook, YouTube. Uh, we're on all of those things. Yeah. Uh, me personally, if you are more driven to like the business side of things, I don't talk about this stuff quite as much on the Goulet Pens channels because it's a little more you know pen focused. For sure. But me, me personally, I've got a Twitter handle, uh, a Brian Goulet underscore, and then I'm on Instagram at Brian dot Goulet, and then I'm on Snapchat as well as just Brian Goulet. Yeah. Brian, hugely valuable. Everyone should check out GouletPens.com. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been an honor. I hope somebody gets something out of this. (laughs) They will for sure. Thanks.